as with uh, previous rounds of hearing, uh, persons who have been given leave to appear and entities that have been given leave, leave to appear have been informed and for the most part uh, those entities and persons have told the solicitors for the commission of who will appear for them. Uh, that being so, there will be no occasion uh, to announce appearances. Uh, again, as in past rounds of hearing, uh, there are some individuals who applied for leave to appear who have been refused leave. And uh, again, the solicitors for the Commission have written to them giving my reasons uh, for refusing uh, the leave that they sought. Ms Orr. Commissioner, today we commence the sixth round of public hearings. These hearings will consider the conduct of financial services entities in the insurance industry. Insurance products are often divided into four types, life insurance, general insurance, health insurance and marine insurance. We will be examining the conduct in the life insurance industry and the general insurance industry. The first week of these hearings will focus on life insurance. We will examine how life insurance products are designed, how they are sold and promoted, how life insurance claims are handled, and the dispute resolution mechanisms that are available in relation to life insurance claims. We will also consider some issues that arise in relation to life insurance products provided through superannuation funds. The second week of the hearings will focus on general insurance. We will examine the case studies that were deferred from the fourth round of hearings, which concerned the experiences of people who had made claims under home insurance policies following natural disasters. We will also consider case studies in relation to add-on insurance sold through car dealerships and travel insurance. At the end of the second week of hearings, we will draw together some of the themes explored in the life insurance and general insurance case studies and consider the regulation of the industry as a whole. Some of the key questions that we will address in this round of hearings are, is there an appropriate balance between self-regulation and external regulation in the insurance industry? In particular, is it appropriate that the handling of insurance claims is currently largely outside of ASIC's jurisdiction? Should the unfair contract terms regime that applies to other consumer contracts be extended to insurance contracts? Should the General Insurance Code of Practice and the Life Insurance Code of Practice be enforceable as contractual terms like the Banking Code of Practice? Or should they be treated like industry codes under the Competition and Consumer Act, which makes a contravention of an applicable industry code a contravention of the Act? Are the changes that have been made to Section 29, Subsection 3 of the Insurance Contracts Act, a provision that deals with the consequences of non-disclosure by an insured person, operating as they intended? What changes to the existing regulatory framework are necessary to improve the experiences of people with mental illness in dealing with life insurance companies? In this opening statement, we will begin by explaining some key features of the regulatory framework for both the life and general insurance industries. We will then outline what each of the financial services entities who have provided witness statements for this round of hearings have acknowledged to the Commission as their own misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to both life and general insurance. In these hearings, we will tender more than 110 witness statements from financial services entities and other entities involved in the life and general insurance industries. We will explain and analyse aspects of these statements at a number of points in the hearings, and we will cross-examine a number of the people who provided these statements. After dealing with acknowledgements of misconduct in this opening statement, 
We will then shift our focus to the life insurance industry, which, as we've mentioned, will be the subject of this first week of hearings. We'll provide an overview of the life insurance industry based in part on data that we have obtained from 10 life insurance companies. We'll then summarise what consumers and consumer advocates have told the Commission about their experiences in the life insurance industry. We'll also touch on what regulators and other bodies working in the area, such as ASIC and the Financial Ombudsman Service, have told the Commission. Finally, we'll briefly introduce the case studies to be explored in the first week of hearings. We start with an overview of the regulatory framework for the life insurance and general insurance industries. The life and general insurance industries are subject to several different types of regulation. First, they are subject to prudential regulation, which is overseen by APRA. Among other things, APRA is responsible for granting or refusing applications to carry on a general insurance or life insurance business in Australia. Prudential regulation of the insurance industry will not be a focus of these hearings. Second, because most contracts of insurance are financial products for the purposes of Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, life insurance and general insurance companies are subject to financial services regulation, which is overseen by ASIC under the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act. Third, the industries are also subject to a number of obligations imposed by the Insurance Contracts Act, which is also administered by ASIC. And fourth, most life and general insurance companies are subject to an industry code of practice. For the life insurance industry, the relevant code is the Life Insurance Code of Practice, which came into effect on the 1st of July last year. For the general insurance industry, the relevant code is the General Insurance Code of Practice, which came into effect on the 1st of July 1996 and has been revised a number of times since then. We'll say something about the second, third and fourth of these forms of regulation, which among other things govern the conduct of insurers in their dealings with policyholders. We deal first with financial services regulation under the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act. Most insurance policies are financial products for the purposes of Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act. Selling these uh, insurance policies is a financial service. This means that insurance companies that issue insurance policies must hold an Australian financial services licence. As we've mentioned in previous rounds of hearings, Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act imposes a number of obligations on holders of Australian financial services licences, including obligations to do all things necessary to ensure that they provide financial services efficiently, honestly and fairly, to have adequate arrangements for managing conflicts of interest, to comply with the financial services laws, to take reasonable steps to ensure that their representatives comply with the financial services laws and to have a dispute resolution system for services to retail clients. Although most life and general insurance policies are financial products and the selling of those policies is a financial service, it is important to note that the handling and settling of insurance claims is specifically excluded from the definition of a financial service. This means that the obligations that we've just referred to, including the obligation for an insurance company to do all things necessary to ensure that it provides financial services efficiently, honestly and fairly, do not apply to the process leading to making a decision about a claim, including the investigation of the claim and the interpretation of policy provisions, to negotiations of settlement amounts, to estimates of loss or damage, value or repair costs, or recommendations on mitigation of loss. This limits ASIC's ability to take action against insurance companies where, for example, there are unnecessary or extensive delays in handling claims. 
Insurance companies are subject to the provisions of the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act concerning misleading and deceptive conduct and unconscionable conduct. However, insurance contracts that are governed by the Insurance Contracts Act are not currently subject to the unfair contract terms provisions of the ASIC Act. And the Insurance Contracts Act limits the ability of policyholders to rely on the other consumer protection provisions in the ASIC Act. Because most insurance policies are financial products, Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act also imposes extensive pre-contractual disclosure requirements in relation to the, those products. In particular, an insurance company that issues a financial product must issue a product disclosure statement in relation to the product. The Insurance Contracts Act, which we turn to next, imposes additional disclosure obligations for certain types of insurance. The Insurance Contracts Act was introduced in 1984. It altered a number of aspects of the common law in relation to insurance contracts to bring about a fairer balance between the interests of the insurer and the insured. We'll outline, outline some key aspects of the Insurance Contracts Act. First, part two of the Insurance Contracts Act contains the duty of utmost good faith. It implies into insurance contracts to which the Act applies a provision requiring each party to the contract to act towards the other party in respect of any matter arising under or in relation to it with the utmost good faith. If an insurer fails to comply with the duty of utmost good faith in relation to its handling or settlement of a claim, this will amount to a breach of a financial services law. However, there is currently no penalty imposed for breaching the duty of utmost good faith. This means that ASIC cannot bring proceedings against an insurer to recover a penalty where it believes the insurer has breached this duty. Second, part four of the Insurance Contracts Act deals with disclosures and misrepresentations and sets out a statutory code dealing with the duties of the insurer and the insured in relation to these topics. We'll briefly mention two aspects. Division one of part four deals with the duty of an insured person to disclose certain matters to the insurer. If the insured does not comply with this duty, the insurer may be entitled to void the policy. In 2014, section 29 of the Insurance Contracts Act was amended, expanding the circumstances in which an insurer could void a life insurance policy for non-disclosure. Since 2014, an insurer has been able to void a policy if it can show that it would not have entered into the same contract of life insurance. Previously, it had to show that it would not have entered into any contract of life insurance. Division four of part four was introduced following inquiries into the widespread flooding in parts of Australia in 2010 and 2011. We'll refer to those inquiries in more detail in the second week of these hearings. Division 4 requires an insurer to provide a key facts sheet in relation to certain policies of insurance, including home insurance, in addition to the product disclosure statement. The third key aspect of the Insurance Contracts Act is contained in Part 4, for, I'm sorry, in Part 5. Division 1 of Part 5 requires insurers to take steps to disclose non-standard or unusual terms in certain types of insurance policies before they can rely on them. And Division 1A of Part 5 provides for a uniform definition of flood in home insurance policies. We'll return to the definition of flood in the second week of the hearings. The fourth key aspect of the Insurance Contracts Act, which we've already touched on, is that it excludes certain consumer protections under other Commonwealth, state or territory legislation from applying to insurance contracts governed by the Act. For example, section 15 of the Act 
prevents an insured person from seeking relief under the ASIC Act on the basis that their insurance contract is unconscionable or unfair or any, because of any misrepresentation in that contract. We turn next to self-regulation. As we mentioned earlier, most life and general insurance companies are subject to an industry code of practice. The general insurance code of practice is a voluntary, self-regulatory code that binds all general insurers who are signatories to it. Members of the Insurance Council of Australia offering products covered by the code are required to subscribe to it. Other industry participants may also subscribe. There are currently 174 subscribers to the code, comprising approximately 97% of the general insurance industry. The code imposes obligations on general insurers when selling, insur or selling insurance, handling claims, dealing with third parties, managing catastrophes and handling complaints. It also sets out timeframes for insurers to respond to claims, complaints and requests for information. Nearly all types of general insurance are covered, including home insurance. Subscribers to the code must meet the timeframes and comply with the obligations set out in the code, including the obligation to conduct claims handling in an honest, fair, transparent and timely manner. Subscribers will be in breach of the code if their employees, authorised representatives or service suppliers fail to comply with the code when acting on their behalf. Subscribers must apply corrective measures within set timeframes as agreed by the Code Governance Committee in response to any code breach. Subscribers must report significant breaches of the code to the Code Governance Committee within 10 business days. We'll consider the General Insurance Code of Practice in more detail in the second week of these hearings. The Life Insurance Code of Practice is binding on all members of the Financial Services Council that issue life insurance policies and on any other industry participant that adopts it. There are currently 26 subscribers to this code, representing the majority of APRA registered life insurers. The code imposes obligations on life insurers during the policy design phase, when selling insurance, and during the claims process. It also has provisions for dealing with consumers who require additional support, including older persons, persons with a disability, or persons from non-English speaking backgrounds, and for those experiencing financial hardship. The code contains provisions dealing with a number of matters that are specific to the provision of life insurance products. For example, it commits insurers to review the medical definitions in its on-sale policies every three years, to comply with particular obligations in relation to surveillance of claimants, including stopping surveillance where there is evidence from a medical examiner that it is negatively impacting the claimant's recovery. It commits insurers to require medical assessors to comply with the Australian Medical Association's ethical guidelines on independent medical assessments and to only re rely on reports from treating doctors, allied health professionals and independent service providers in relation to an application for insurance or a claim that the insurer is satisfied are impartial and objective. There are a number of differences between the standards imposed by the Life Insurance Code of Practice and the General Insurance Code of Practice. We will explore some of these at the end of the second week of the hearings. Compliance with the Life Insurance Code of Practice is monitored by the Life Code Compliance Committee. Subscribers must report significant breaches of the code to the committee and must implement corrective measures as agreed with the committee. Although many Australians hold life insurance policies through their superannuation, 
the life insurance code of practice does not apply to superannuation fund trustees unless they specifically adopt it. In late 2016, a number of insurance and superannuation industry bodies formed the Insurance in Superannuation Working Group to develop a code of practice for superannuation trustees. The Insurance in Superannuation Voluntary Code of Practice was introduced on the 1st of July this year. It is voluntary and non-enforceable. It covers issues such as benefit design, cessation of cover, claims handling, premium adjustment mechanism policies and disclosure, communications with members and dispute resolution. Superannuation fund trustees who choose to adopt the code are not required to comply with it until the 1st of July 2021. Before leaving the regulatory framework for general and life insurance, we make some brief observations about the dispute resolution mechanisms for the insurance industry. <coughs> Because insurance companies are required to hold an Australian Financial Services licence, they must have an internal dispute resolution procedure that complies with ASIC's Regulatory Guide 165, and they must be members of an ASIC-approved external dispute resolution scheme, such as the Financial Ombudsman Service. Both the Life Insurance Code of Practice and the General Insurance Code of Practice impose obligations on insurers in relation to the handling of complaints through their internal dispute resolution procedures. These obligations include timelines for handling complaints and for providing information about dispute resolution processes. The Commission has heard in previous hearings that the Australian Financial Complaints Authority will replace the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Credit and Investments Ombudsman on the 1st of November this year. It will also replace the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, which could hear consumer complaints about life insurance policies held in superannuation funds. External dispute resolution schemes like FOS play an important role in ensuring that the requirements of the general insurance and life insurance codes of practice are enforced. When determining a dispute, both FOS and the SCT can consider whether an insurer has complied with the standards of the relevant code. FOS also has a procedure for identifying systemic issues in relation to insurers' compliance with financial services laws. Commissioner, we turn now to the misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations that has been acknowledged by insurance entities. This information has been provided in response to the letters from you, Commissioner, sent late last year and early this year, asking entities to identify any misconduct they had engaged in or any conduct that fell below community standards and expectations since the 1st of January 2008. We begin with AIA Australia Limited, which has provided three submissions to the Commission. AIA is the country's largest group life insurer by market share. AIA acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards, standards and expectations. We give some examples of the acknowledgements. First, AIA acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct since 2014 by failing to provide notices to up to 1,000 customers, which meant that they may have been unaware that their life insurance had been cancelled for the non-payment of premiums. Second, AIA acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct by overcharging premiums. In November 2009, AIA identified that premium payments were being deducted twice from customer credit cards as a result of a system error. The total amount overcharged was $775,000. In 2016, AIA identified that approximately 500 further customers were charged double the premium due because of another systems error. Third, 
AIA acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations by incorrectly calculating the pre-disablement income of policyholders making a claim. AIA identified that the issue adversely affected 305 claims between 2012 and 2017 and led to an expected underpayment to policyholders of more than $3.9 million. Fourth, AIA acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to consumer credit insurance. It acknowledged that during 2011 and 2012, it received approximately 300 complaints in respect of its consumer credit insurance policies sold directly through a call centre and through partner websites. The complaints concerned mis-selling, poor service, incorrect charges and unclear explanations of the products and their policy coverage. The complaints indicated that a number of customers were unaware that they had taken out consumer credit insurance, that they did not understand the policy terms or were unaware of the amount of the insurance charges. Fifth, AIA acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to funeral insurance products sold between 2011 and 2016 in circumstances where some features of those products were not consistent with the recommendations in ASIC Report 454 on funeral insurance. We turn next to Allianz and its related entities, including its registered life insurer, Allianz Australia Life Insurance Limited. Allianz provided one submission to the Commission. Allianz told the Commission that it had identified 49 incidents of misconduct and two incidents of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. One type of acknowledged misconduct related to overcharging policyholders. In September 2013, Allianz discovered that it had overcharged customers who had paid for their insurance in monthly instalments by incorrectly debiting their bank accounts after they had reduced their level of cover. The issue impacted approximately 2,500 customers who were re refunded a total of more than $650,000. In 2014, Allianz discovered that approximately 11,700 customers who had taken out a consumer credit insurance policy through various motor vehicle dealers had been overcharged. Allianz refunded more than $1.8 million in relation to approximately 11,700 policies. In February 2017, AWP, an entity in the Allianz corporate group, identified an error in its product disclosure statement for its credit card travel insurance product. AWP identified 2,700 customers who were erroneously charged a risk-based premium. Affected policyholders were reimbursed a total of over $385,000. The second type of acknowledged misconduct related to Allianz's claims handling processes. Allianz, Allianz acknowledged that from July to September 2011, AWP had failed to respond to approximately 6,000 travel insurance claims within the general insurance code timeframe of 10 business days. In late 2013, Allianz became aware of discrepancies between refund amounts being paid by financiers to Allianz customers upon cancellation of their consumer credit insurance policy and the amount payable under the National Credit Code. Allianz refunded the 1,761 impacted customers, approximately $186,000. In 2015, Allianz identified breaches of the Insurance Contracts Act relating to the cancellation of policies. Approximately 11,000 policies were impacted annually. The conduct that Allianz acknowledged as having fallen below community expectations and standards included conduct in relation to add-on insurance products 
sold through car dealers. In light of ASIC's reports on this topic, Allianz acknowledged that there were groups of customers of car dealers who may have obtained Allianz insurance products through a general advice model which were not suited to their individual circumstances. This conduct was the subject of a lengthy investigation by ASIC. Allianz has agreed to remediate affected customers and expects the total remediation to be approximately $45.6 million. We turn to AMP and its related entities, including AMP Life, one of the largest life insurers in Australia. AMP has provided four submissions to the Commission. AMP acknowledged that it engaged in possible misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. We provide the following examples. First, AMP acknowledged that it engaged in possible misconduct during the period from March 2010 to September 2014, which it described as insurance rewriting conduct. We explained this conduct in our opening statement to the second round of hearings, which essentially involved an authorised representative recommending that a customer cancel one life insurance policy, one AMP life insurance policy, and replace it with another AMP life insurance policy so they could collect the maximum upfront commission payable. Second, AMP acknowledged that delays in its assessment of insurance claims may constitute a failure to meet community expectations. AMP said that the majority of complaints which it receives from its life insurance customers relate to delays in the assessment of their insurance claims, particularly in relation to claims for total and permanent disability. We turn next to Clearview Wealth Limited and its related entities, which provided one submission to the Commission. Clearview identified 225 instances related to the life insurance arm of the business, which it said might amount to misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. 16 of these related to the mis-selling of insurance cover by sales agents, including one instance of a customer being provided with false or misleading information in relation to the purchase, another instance of a customer being coerced into taking out a policy, and another of a customer being sold a policy that they did not understand. Clearview acknowledged that there were instances where its life insurance sales practices fell below community standards and expectations, and said that it has endeavoured to remediate affected customers. Clearview also acknowledged that it had reported to ASIC in May last year that it was unable to verify that the anti-hawking requirements for unsolicited sales in the Corporations Act had been met with respect to 278,664 of its sales calls. This matter and other aspects of Clearview's sales practices will be the subject of the first case study in these hearings. We, we turn next to CBA and its related entities, including its registered life insurer, Colonial Mutual Life Assurance Society Limited, or CMLA. CBA has provided three submissions to the Commission. In its third submission, CBI identified, in short form, over 60 specific matters of misconduct over the last five years that related to insurance. Of these, more than 30 appeared to relate to life insurance. CBA also acknowledged that it has engaged in conduct falling below community standards and expectations in connection with the provision of insurance. We give two examples of CBA's acknowledgements. First, CBA acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to Cominsure's life insurance products and claims handling practices. An ASIC investigation concluded that Cominsure's trauma policies had medical definitions that were out of date with prevailing medical practice. 
Cominsure updated its medical definitions, including for heart attack and rheumatoid arthritis, and wrote to approximately 600,000 customers, informing them of the change definition. Cominsure also searched for previously declined claims. As a result of that exercise, Cominsure paid more than 30 customers a total amount of more than $4 million. Following a related ASIC investigation into advertising and promotion, which concluded in December last year, Cominsure agreed to pay $300,000 in relation to misleading and deceptive statements made on some of Cominsure's websites about the extent to which customers would be entitled to cover for trauma if they suffered a heart attack. These matters will be examined in a case study in this first week of the hearings. Second, CBA acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to its sale of consumer credit insurance. In 2015, CBA identified that some customers who purchase Credit Card Plus insurance may not have met the employment eligibility criteria in the product terms, and therefore they may not have been able to claim certain benefits under the policy. The number of Credit Card Plus customers impacted was approximately 65,000. CBA had refunded $10 million as of the 29th of January this year. This conduct was the subject of a case study in the Commission's first round of hearings. We turn next to Freedom Insurance Group and its related entities, which provided one submission to the Commission. Freedom acknowledged that it had engaged in nine incidents of misconduct and 76 incidents of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in connection with the marketing and distribution of life insurance products. We give three examples of these acknowledgements. First, Freedom acknowledged misconduct in relation to the direct sale of insurance products. Freedom told the Commission of six separate complaints received in the period since January 2013 in relation to attempts by its representatives to sell insurance products to vulnerable customers. Four of these complaints related to customers with disabilities. Freedom also acknowledged that it may have breached the anti-hawking provisions in the Corporations Act in relation to telephone sales, processes and procedures for unsolicited calls. Second, Freedom acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to its cancellation and customer retention practices. Freedom told the Commission of approximately 27 complaints received in the period since January 2013 in relation to customers who had attempted to cancel their insurance policies. 11 of these complaints related to delays in actioning requests to cancel or in getting into contact with customers who had requested to cancel their policies. Another 11 related to customers still being charged premiums after having requested the cancellation of their policy. And five were general complaints about Freedom's processes. Third, Freedom acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in respect of five customers who made complaints claiming that they either did not agree to buy a policy did not agree to direct debits against their bank accounts in respect of a policy, did not recall agreeing to the policy in the first place, or considered that the policy that they had agreed to was materially different to the policy they received. The conduct of Freedom Insurance will be the subject of the second case study in these hearings. We turn next to Insurance Australia Group Limited, or IAG, and its related entities, which provided four submissions to the Commission. IAG is one of Australia's leading general insurance groups and sells insurance under a number of brands, including NRMA Insurance, CGU, SGIO and SGIC. IAG told the Commission that it had identified 112 instances of misconduct 
and 40 instances of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. We give three examples of those acknowledgements. I'm sorry, we'll give four. The first is that IAG acknowledged that it engaged in misconduct reflected in a number of FOS determinations that there were systemic issues in relation to its sale processes and handling of claims. These included a determination in relation to the process for selling add-on insurance in 2016, a determination in relation to complaints handling procedures also in 2016, and a determination in relation to a failure to provide information in product disclosure statements to explain how a premium was calculated in 2011. Second, IAG acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations by increasing its premiums on home building policies in 2013 to levels which the Office of the Fire Services Levy Monitor in Victoria considered were unreasonably high. IAG entered into an enforceable undertaking by which it undertook to refund customers an amount equivalent to the 11% increase in base premiums plus statutory charges relating to that increase. Third, IAG acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to the sale of various insurance products, including add-on insurance, through motor dealers. The conduct was engaged in by Swan Insurance, an IAG-related entity, and was investigated by ASIC in 2016. ASIC raised multiple issues of concern about the conduct including concerns with poor product design and pricing, low claims payments relative to premiums, and unfair outcomes for customers as a result of sales processes. Swan provided partial, and in some cases full, refunds to approximately 68,000 affected customers. The amount refunded, including interest, is expected to total approximately $39 million. Fourth, on the 29th of June 2018, IAG made a further disclosure to the Commission concerning payments made by Swan to 34 of its authorised representatives that may have exceeded the maximum allowable Commission amount for consumer credit insurance products under Section 145 of the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. IAG identified 153 payments, totalling in excess of $6.79 million, at least $5.98 million of which related to consumer credit insurance, that had been made between 2008 and 2016. In its disclosure letter, IAG did not specifically characterise this conduct as misconduct. Before leaving IAG, we mentioned that late last week, on the 7th of September, IAG provided additional information to the Commission in relation to the sale of add-on insurance by motor dealers. In that further letter, IAG identified a general practice the sale of gap insurance with adjustable pricing, and a further six specific instances where Swan may have engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. The conduct of Swan and IAG in connection with the sale of add-on insurance through motor dealers will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. We turn to MetLife Insurance Limited and its related entities, which provided one submission to the Commission. MetLife is the third largest provider of group insurance in the Australian market. MetLife ref referred to seven reported judgments of a court where findings had been made against it, which it said may constitute misconduct. MetLife also told the Commission that 20 determinations adverse to MetLife had been made by FOS and the SCT and that it has not been the subject of specific regulatory investigation or sanction. MetLife acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to claims handling processes 
for insured members who had claimed for mental health conditions, including by the use of surveillance. We turn to MLC Limited. MLC is the third largest life insurer in Australia on the basis of total premiums in force. Since the 3rd of October 2016, MLC has been 80% owned by Nippon Life Insurance Company, who acquired this shareholding from NAB. NAB continues to hold the remaining 20% of MLC's issued shares. MLC provided two submissions to the Commission. MLC acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to the provision of life insurance. We give three examples. First, MLC told the Commission that in 2016, it undertook a claims assurance review in consultation with ASIC, which examined its claims handling system for life insurance products. As part of that review, an independent expert identified 26 instances where MLC did not apply and properly interpret the correct policy term or exclusion, some of which it said could be characterised as misconduct. The independent expert identified a further 55 claim files where the claims management process was not efficient, honest and fair. Seven instances where MLC failed to assess claims within the time period specified under the Life Insurance Code of Practice or ASIC Regulatory Guide 165 and recommended that in 11 cases, ex gratia payments be made to customers with the aggregate amount paid to date being $431,000. Second, MLC acknowledged that over the last 10 years, there have been approximately 245 legal proceedings brought against it across Australia, half of which related to TPD claims. 16 of the legal proceedings resulted in the plaintiff's claim for insurance benefits being admitted and paid. MLC also acknowledged that over that period approximately 1,890 complaints had been brought against it in FOS and approximately 460 complaints in the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. Most of these were resolved prior to determination but there were 69 instances in which FOS upheld the customer's complaint and five instances where a customer's complaint was upheld by the SCT. Over the last 10 years, MLC has also reported 40 breaches either to ASIC under the Corporations Act or to APRA under the Life Insurance Act. Finally, MLC acknowledged that in 2014 and 15, NAB conducted a review of the consumer credit insurance policies issued by MLC and identified instances where cancellation of cover was not actioned and where there appeared to be a limited customer value in the death cover components of the products. NAB's submissions to the Commission also addressed conduct on the part of MLC prior to October 2016. NAB acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations uh, in 37 incidents related to insurance over the last five years. We give two examples of those acknowledgements. First, NAB acknowledged misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to incorrect death and TPD tests that applied to certain members of some superannuation accounts between May 2013 and October 2015. This resulted in some members having their claims incorrectly rejected or declined, receiving lower payments, or being told they were not eligible for cover when they were. Approximately $2.3 million has been paid to members or their beneficiaries affected by this conduct. Second, NAB acknowledged that in 2013, a systems error affected members who paid their premiums through their superannuation accounts. MLC paid over $360,000 in refunds to people affected by this conduct. 
we turn next to ANZ and its related entities, which provided two submissions to the Commission, followed by three sets of corrections and amendments. ANZ's associated entities include One Path Life Limited and One Path General Insurance Limited. ANZ acknowledged 17 instances of misconduct over the last five years that related to insurance. It also acknowledged conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to the provision of life insurance products. We give three examples of these acknowledgements. First, ANZ acknowledged that it engaged in misconduct between 2008 and 2013 when it delayed processing and allocating to members a total of $13.7 million being the proceeds of a class action of which One Path Life was a member. This affected approximately 13,629 members. In addition to allocating the proceeds to members, ANZ ultimately paid compensatory interest of over $1.5 million. Second, ANZ acknowledged that it engaged in misconduct between 2009 and 2013 regarding an error in the price of units made available under a One Path Master Investment Life Insurance Policy due to a control gap in One, Path's life, One Path Life's annual tax reconciliation. This affected approximately 60,000 members and was reported to ASIC and APRA in May 2014. Compensation totalling approximately $600,000 was paid. Third, ANZ acknowledged that One Path General had engaged in misconduct between April 2011 and September 2013 when 1,640 policyholders were not paid stamp duty and transfer costs when their claims for total loss pursuant to comprehensive car insurance policies were settled. The administration of the claims was carried out by QBE Insurance on behalf of both One Path General and QBE, who were in a co-insurance arrangement. The issue was discovered after FOS made a determination in a particular individual's case. The affected customers were ultimately paid approximately $450,000. We turn to QBE Insurance Group Limited and its related entities, which provided one submission to the Commission. QBE told the Commission that it is one of the world's top 20 general insurance and reinsurance companies. QBE did not make any acknowledgements of misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards or expectations. However, it identified a number of issues in relation to insurance. We give some examples of these issues. First, QBE acknowledged that since 2008, its gap protection and consumer credit insurance products have been sold through car dealerships in circumstances where there might not have been a gap between the insured value of the car and the loan balance, where the customer had paid a large deposit for the car, where the cover may have duplicated existing cover, or the cover may have provided more insurance than was necessary. QBE estimated that 28,520 customers were affected by this conduct. It established a remediation program through which it estimates that customers will be paid $15.9 million. Second, QBE acknowledged that FOS has determined that there have been several systemic issues with QBE's practices. One of these concerned QBE's failure between May 2015 and December 2017 to implement FOS determinations in a timely manner or within specified timeframes. Another concerned instances of QBE's customer relations team failing to communicate with customers within the time frame set out in ASIC's Regulatory Guide 165. On the 10th of March last year, QBE identified 1,520 open complaints, of which 681 had responses overdue. 
QBE told the Commission that this delay issue was resolved in June last year to the satisfaction of FOS and that it had notified ASIC of the issue. Third, QBE acknowledged that in 2012 and 13, it over-collected the fire and emergency services levy amount from customers in Victoria due to an administrative error in its calculation. QBE refunded approximately $1.1 million to approximately 11,000 customers. Fourth, QBE acknowledged that in 2015, the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal made findings that it had engaged in discrimination in contravention of the Equal Opportunity Act in the case of Ingram against QBE Insurance. Ms Ingram had purchased a travel insurance policy from QBE for an overseas school trip. Ms Ingram was subsequently diagnosed with depression and decided not to attend the school trip. QBE denied Ms Ingram's claim for reimbursement of the costs of the trip on the basis of a general mental health exclusion in the relevant policy. VCAT found that QBE had engaged in discrimination and ordered it to pay Ms Ingram more than $19,000. We turn next to Retail Employees Superannuation Proprietary Limited, or REST. REST provided one submission to the Commission. REST told the Commission that it is among the largest superannuation funds by membership and that around 1.4 million fund members, or approximately 70% of the total fund membership, have insurance cover through the fund. REST identified one instance of potential misconduct relating to insurance. In 2015, REST members who were eligible for automatic reinstatement of the fund's basic insurance cover at age 25 did not have their basic insurance cover reinstated on meeting eligibility criteria. For the period from the 1st of June 2009 to the 30th of June 2013, 1,634 current eligible members not linked to an employer or who otherwise met cover criteria also did not have basic cover automatically reinstated. Further, 1,570 members uh, age 25 who subsequently did meet eligibility criteria for automatic reinstatement of basic cover did not receive prior notice of this fact. We turn next to Suncorp and its related entities, which provided two submissions to the Commission. Suncorp Life and Superannuation Limited conducts Suncorp's life insurance business. AAAI Limited conducts Suncorp's general insurance business and is one of Australia's largest general insurers by gross written premium. AAAI sells insurance policies under a number of brands, including Amy, GIO, Apia and Bingle. Suncorp acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to the provision of insurance. We give some examples of its acknowledgements. First, Suncorp acknowledged that on five separate occasions in 2016 and 17, FOS determined that there was a systemic issue in relation to the provision and handling of insurance. These systemic issues included the delayed resolution of internal dispute resolution processes, a failure to provide information about internal dispute resolution processes to customers, delays in the implementation of FOS negotiated settlements with customers, delays in claims handling, and failing to adequately bring the duty of disclosure to the attention of policyholders via the online application process. Second, Suncorp acknowledged that following an internal review of medical definitions in 2016, it found that three medical conditions in its life insurance policies needed to be updated. Third, Suncorp acknowledged that following a customer complaint in 2016, in which it was alleged that surveillance had caused a deterioration in the customer's mental health, it found broader inconsistencies in the way in which its surveillance policy had been applied 
particularly in relation to its workers' compensation claims process. Fourth, Suncorp acknowledged that earlier this year it agreed with ASIC to conduct a remediation program in relation to the sale of add-on insurance through car dealers, specifically gap insurance and loan protection insurance. The remediation program involves payments of approximately $17.2 million to customers. Fifth, Suncorp acknowledged that in 2014, infringement notices were issued to AAAI in respect of televised and website advertising that was misleading in regards to the saving customers might make by switching to Amy car insurance. AAAI was required to pay $20,400 under the infringement notices. In 2016, ASIC issued further infringement notices for misleading online and radio advertising of AAAI's home insurance policies. AAAI was required to pay $43,200 under these notices. This conduct will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. We turn to TAL and its related entities, including its registered life insurer, TAL Life Limited, which provided one submission to the Commission. TAL identified 31 incidents of misconduct and 19 incidents of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in connection with the provision of life insurance. Again, we give examples of those acknowledgements. First, TAL acknowledged misconduct in respect of its sales practices. TAL acknowledged two incidents of misconduct relating to misleading television and online advertisements, which led to ASIC issuing infringement notices. TAL paid a $30,000 infringement notice in 2014 and a $10,000 infringement notice in 2015. Second, TAL acknowledged misconduct in relation to misleading and unsolicited sales calls. In December 2010, it identified approximately 10,381 instances where it did not meet the unsolicited call requirements of the Corporations Act. In July 2011, it identified approximately 17,000 leads that may have contained a breach of anti-hawking provisions for failing to obtain appropriate customer consent. In addition, from 2012 to 2017, TAL identified that approximately 3.5% of its monitored calls were misleading sales calls according to its internal criteria. It identified that approximately 0.2% of its monitored calls involved unconscionable conduct, according to its internal criteria. These included instances of selling to vulnerable or potentially vulnerable people, including customers who appeared disengaged during the call or who had limited literacy, comprehension or communication skills, and instances of an insurance representative selling a policy to a customer who indicated that they had a guardian or were under the guardianship of the public trustee. TAL acknowledged that for the life broker business, which it acquired at the end of 2013, approximately 15% of its monitored calls in the first year were misleading sales calls according to TAL's internal criteria. In relation to another business acquired by TAL, Insurance Line, TAL also identified sales practices that were below community standards and expectations. TAL attributed this to a more sales-oriented culture where insurance representatives received lower fixed remuneration and higher variable remuneration. Third, TAL acknowledged misconduct in respect of overcharging or underpaying policyholders between 2004 and 2009, again in 2012, again in 2014, and again in 2016. In August 2017, TAL determined that it had been underpaying and overpaying income protection claims for some of its legacy policies from as far back as 2006. 
TAO's initial testing of a sample of 110 claims revealed approximately 65% of claims were overpaid and 35% were underpaid. As at early 2018, TAO was still working through what remediation was necessary. Fourth, TAL acknowledged that its practice of imposing blanket mental health exclusions on some of its direct income protection policies fell below community standards and expectations. We turn to Westpac and its related entities, which include Westpac General Insurance Limited. Westpac has provided a number of submissions and supporting documents to the Commission. Westpac acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct conduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. Accompanying the submissions it provided the Commission in February were 14 schedules compiling instances of misconduct over the last five years. Westpac's submissions identified over 250 incidents relating to insurance in these tables. We provide some examples. First, Westpac acknowledged that Westpac General Insurance engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in 2016 and 17 by breaching obligations in the General Insurance Code of Practice in relation to the timeliness of providing updates to customers on the progress of home and contents claims. In addition, it identified a number of cancellations of home and contents insurance policies between April 2015 and March 2017, where refunds were not sent to customers within the 15 business days required by the General Insurance Code of Practice. Approximately 8,600 customers were refunded a total of $829,000, including interest. Second, Westpac acknowledged that Westpac General Insurance engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to the non-payment of additional benefits to home and contents insurance clients, such as benefits relating to demolition and removal of debris. Westpac told the Commission that it is currently reviewing its historic claims payments since 2013 to ensure that all relevant additional payments have been made. Third, Westpac acknowledged that it engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations during the period from 2006 to 2015 by incorrectly applying premium loadings to 216 customers with 273 life insurance policies. Westpac has refunded approximately $611,000 for these premium, um, incorrect premium loadings. We turn to UWI, which provided one submission to the Commission. UWI told the Commission that it currently insures over 640,000 Australians with around 1 million policies in force. UWI acknowledged 12 incidents of misconduct and three incidents of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. Again, we give some examples. First, UWI acknowledged misconduct in relation to its handling of catastrophe claims between May 2010 and February 2011. In 2011, the Code Governance Committee identified breaches by UWI of the General Insurance Code of Practice in that it had failed to notify customers whose property claims were finalised within one month of a catastrophe or disaster of their entitlement to seek a review of their claim if they thought the assessment of their loss was not complete or accurate. It also failed to provide those customers with information about the company's complaints handling procedures. Approximately 71 catastrophe claims were settled during that period. Second, UWI acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct by failing to send renewal notices to customers within 14 days prior to the expiry of their policy. The customers were refunded $90,296 for premiums that UWI collected between the date the policy was renewed automatically and the date UWI renegotiated renewal terms. Third, UWI acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct 
by charging some customers premiums without their consent. UE refunded approximately $14,000 to 102 customers. Finally, UE acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to the Victorian Fire Services levy between July 2011 and June 2012. UE acknowledged that it overcollected $639,000 in total on approximately 22,000 policies. Finally, we turn to Zurich Australia Group and its related entities, which provided one submission to the Commission. Zurich operates its life insurance business through Zurich Australia Limited and its general insurance business through Zurich Australia Insurance Limited. Zurich acknowledged misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. Again, we give examples. First, Zurich acknowledged misconduct by making errors in various communications with customers, including renewal statements, claims resolution letters, and product disclosure statements. Second, Zurich acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct in relation to claims handling. On 14 occasions in 2016 and 17, it failed to manage some life insurance complaints in line with ASIC's Regulatory Guide 165, including by failing to notify of claims decisions and to respond to complaints within prescribed timeframes. Zurich also acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct in the way it applied the terms of its policies, which FOS determined to be a systemic issue on four separate occasions. Commissioner, up to this point in this opening statement, we have considered both the life insurance industry and the general insurance industry. For the remainder of this opening statement, we'll turn specifically to the life insurance industry. That industry is a significant part of the Australian economy. In the year ending the 31st of March this year, life insurers in Australia earned $18.3 billion in direct premiums from customers. As at this same date, the value of total assets held by life insurance companies in Australia was $230.1 billion. There are two main types of life insurance products, risk policies and investment linked policies. In general terms, investment linked policies pay a benefit when a person dies or on some other specified date, the value of which is determined by the value of a class of assets held by the insurer. As at the 31st of December last year, there were approximately 2 million investment linked policies in Australia. By contrast, risk policies provide for a specified benefit to be paid on the death or disability of the insured, or if the insured is found to have a specific disease or injury. As at the 31st of December last year, there were approximately 14.9 million risk policies in Australia. Commissioner, when we refer to life insurance policies in these hearings, we will be referring to risk policies and not investment linked policies. Investment linked policies will not be a point of focus in these hearings. In preparation for this round of hearings, the Commission sought witness statements from the largest 10 of the 15 life insurers that were the subject of ASIC's report into claims handling in the life insurance industry in 2016. They are TAL, AIA, MLC, Westpac, MetLife, Zurich, Cominsure, OnePath, Suncorp and AMP. The statements that we sought address the way that those insurers design life insurance products sell and promote life insurance products, handle life insurance claims, and remunerate the personnel involved in selling life insurance products and handling life insurance claims. Over the course of this week, we will tender those statements and say something about the information that the life insurers provided about each of those topics. For now, we will address three topics that arise from those statements. First, how Australians buy life insurance. 
Second, who they buy their life insurance from. And third, what types of life insurance products they buy. Before doing that, um, we note that the different insurers recorded or accounted for the information that the Commission asked about in different ways. This means that there were differences in the ways that the amount of premiums paid and numbers of policies sold were reported across the different statements. The relevant differences are explained in detail in the insurer's witness statements. We deal first with how Australians buy life insurance. We asked the 10 life insurers about the way they sell and promote life insurance products. In Australia, life insurance is provided through three main channels. In the direct or non-advised distribution channel, an insurer sells a life insurance product directly to the consumer without any personal financial product advice. In the retail distribution channel, life insurance products are sold through financial advisors. In the group distribution channel, a group policy is purchased by a trustee of a superannuation fund or an employer with the fund members or employees having the benefit of the cover under the life insurance policy. We asked the 10 life insurers to provide data in respect of their sales through these three channels for each year from 2013. Could we please show document RCD 0026 0001, 0001. This chart shows sales of new policies through each channel by those 10 insurers for the calendar year 2017, with the exception of TAL, which provided data for the year from the 1st of April 2017 to the 31st of March this year, and Westpac, which provided data for the year from the 1st of October 2016 to the 30th of September 2017. As can be seen from this chart, the overwhelming majority of policies were sold through the retail channel, which accounted for approximately 84% of the policies sold that year. Policies through the direct channel accounted for approximately 15%, and policies sold through the group channel were less than 1% when considering the number of policies sold. Of course, that figure for the group channel represents policies sold to superannuation trustees. If you instead count the number of policies held within superannuation funds, it is clear that the overwhelming majority of life insurance policies are held through superannuation funds. As at August last year, more than 70% of Australian life insurance policies were held in this way. Commissioner, could I tender that document? Uh, exhibit 6.1 will be a uh, chart, how do Australians buy life insurance, RCD 0026 0001 0001. Another way of considering the sales through the different sales channels is by looking at the premiums paid for the policies sold in each channel. Could we please show document RCD 0026 0001 0002? As we can see from this chart, when considering the premiums paid, group sales represent 40% of premiums, Retail sales represent 55% and direct sales represent only 5%. This is consistent with what a number of the 10 life insurers told the Commission about the types of policies sold through the direct channel. Often those policies had fewer features than policies sold through financial advisors and or more exclusions. We'll explore the direct sale of life insurance in the first two case studies this week. As we can see from this chart, in 2017, more than half of the premiums paid in relation to new policies issued by these life insurers came from policies sold through the retail channel, that is, through financial advisors. 
As you'll recall, Commissioner, the financial advice industry was the subject of the second round of the Commission's hearings, which took place in April. Because issues relating to financial advice were considered in some detail in those hearings, the sale of life insurance through financial advisers will not be the subject of a specific case study in the coming week. However, in recognition of the significant role that financial advice plays in the sale of life insurance, we want to say something further about what the witness statements from the 10 life insurers say about the sale of life insurance through this channel. Perhaps if I could first tender that document before I move on, Commissioner. The chart of premiums from sales of new policies by channel RCD 0026 0001 0002 exhibit 6.2. We start with some observations about commissions. We asked the 10 life insurers to provide us with information about the monetary and non-monetary benefits that they, as product issuers, provide to financial advisers. You'll recall, Commissioner, that one of the topics addressed in the second round of hearings was the way in which particular remuneration structures for financial advisers could lead to poor financial advice. Another topic addressed in that round of hearings was the ban on conflicted remuneration that was introduced in July 2013 as part of the future of financial advice reforms and the various exceptions to that ban. Until the 1st of January this year, commissions paid in respect of life risk insurance products other than group life policies and life policies for members of default superannuation funds were exempt from the ban on conflicted remuneration. This meant that product issuers, life insurance companies, could continue to pay financial advisers high rates of upfront and trial commission to encourage the advisers to recommend their products. The witness statements that we received from the life insurers showed that each of them paid commissions to financial advisers or financial advice entities whose clients purchased their products. In the five-year period that we asked about, Zurich paid more than $113 million in commissions in respect of its life insurance products. AMP paid more than $380 million. MetLife paid more than $390 million. CMLA paid more than $460 million. Suncorp paid more than $590 million. Westpac paid more than $640 million and a further $112 million in grandfathered commissions in relation to life insurance arrangements within superannuation accounts. AIA paid more than $690 million. OnePath paid more than $830 million. TAL paid more than $840 million and MLC paid more than $1.16 billion in commissions. That amounts to a total of more than $6 billion in commissions to financial advisers in connection with the sale of life cover issued by these 10 insurers in about five years. The second round of hearings also touched on the life insurance framework reforms, which came into effect on the 1st of January this year. Under those reforms, caps have now been imposed on the amounts that life insurers can pay in upfront and trial commissions. This year, the relevant caps are 80% for upfront and 20% for trial commissions. The cap for upfront commissions will reduce to 70% and then 60% in the next two years. We observed that before the 1st of January this year, a number of the life insurers paid more than 80% in upfront commissions, but less than 20% in trial commissions. From the 1st of January this year, life insurers have adjusted their commission rates to match the caps imposed by the life insurance framework reforms. At least one life insurer offered financial advisers the option to dial down commissions. If the advisor chose a lower commission, the customer would pay a lower insurance premium. 
As the cap on upfront commissions continues to reduce over the next few years, it remains to be seen whether this will be reflected in the premiums paid by customers. We also want to make some observations about approved product lists. Several of the life insurers who we asked to provide witness statements had aligned financial advice entities. These included MLC during the period when it was owned wholly by NAB, Westpac, CMLA, OnePath, Suncorp and AMP. We asked these insurers to provide information about the approved product lists maintained by their aligned financial advice entities, including the processes they have in place for selecting products for inclusion on their approved product lists, and for deciding whether to allow their financial advisors to recommend financial products that are not on their approved product lists. In some cases, we were told that the financial advice entities maintained approved product lists that only included the products of the aligned life insurer. For example, between 2013 and 2017, all of the life insurance products on the approved product <coughs> list for Westpac employed financial advisors were in-house products. This was changed this year when two other life insurers were added to the approved product list. Similarly, between 2013 and 2015, all of the life insurance products on the approved product list <coughs> for financial advisors employed by Suncorp Advice were in-house products. This was changed in 2016 when two other life insurers were added to the approved product list. In other cases, even where the financial advice entities maintained approved product lists that included the products of other life insurers, clients' funds were still directed to the products of the aligned life insurers. For example, between 2014 and 2018, 26% of the life insurance products on the approved product list for ANZ financial planning were in-house products that is, OnePath products. However, in 2014, 88% of the new insurance premiums paid, were paid in respect of OnePath products. In the following years, that figure was 84%, then 78%, then 71%. Between 2013 and 2017, a quarter of the life insurance products on the approved product list for AMP financial planning were in-house products. However, in 2014, 57% of new insurance premiums were paid in respect of in-house products. In the following years, that figure reduced to 45%, then 41%, then 30%. Between 2013 and 2018, Affinia, a financial advice entity associated with TAL, has had an open approved product list policy with between 10 and 12 insurers on its approved product list. However, in each of those years, between 30 and 47 per cent of the commission that Affinia advisors have received for sales of new life insurance policies has come from TAL. We also want to make some observations about non-monetary benefits. As we've mentioned, the ban on conflicted remuneration introduced as part of the FOFA reforms applied to non-monetary benefits as well as monetary benefits. However, this was subject to certain exemptions, including for benefits worth less than $300, and certain benefits provided for a genuine education or training purpose or for the provision of information technology, software or support. We asked the 10 life insurers about the non-monetary benefits that they provide to financial advisors and financial advice entities. A number of them told the Commission <coughs> that they organise conferences or roadshows for financial advisors. TAL told the Commission that since 2015, it has operated a risk academy 
which is a professional development program for financial advisors. TAL estimated that it had spent more than half a million dollars on the Risk Academy in each year that it has been in operation. Several of the life insurers also told the Commission that they make sponsorship payments to financial advice entities to pay for education and training for financial advisors. For example, in each of the last five financial years, AIA spent between $1.7 and $3.6 million in sponsorship payments to financial advice entities. Similarly, in each of the last five TAL financial years, that is from the 1st of April to the 30th of March, TAL spent between $1 and $2.3 million in sponsorship payments to financial advice entities. AIA told the Commission that the benefit of these payments to AIA included enabling it to associate its brand with beneficial activities for financial advisors and giving it opportunities to interact directly with financial advisors. TAL told the Commission that the benefits of these payments to TAL included raising brand awareness and deepening and broadening its relationships with financial advisors. Having made these observations about how Australians buy life insurance, we turn to who they buy life insurance from. We ask the 10 life insurers to provide data about the premiums they receive for life insurance policies that are currently in force. Could we please show document RCD 0026 0001 0003. As we can see from this chart, as at 2017, TAL and AIA were the largest of the 10 insurers by premiums paid for life insurance policies in force, receiving approximately 17.4% and 16.7% of those premiums, respectively. We also asked the life insurers to provide data about the number of new life insurance policies sold by the insurers in each of the last five years and the premiums paid in respect of those new policies. Before I move to that analysis, could I tender this document, Commissioner? Exhibit 6.3, premium income, chart of premium income from policies uh, in force, RCD 0026 0001 0003. Now, if possible, could we please show side by side RCD 0026 0001 0004 and RCD 0026 0001 0005. Thank you. The, the data produced for 2017 shows uh, TAL and AIA also had the highest number of new policies sold in 2017. TAL and AIA also had the highest amounts of premiums paid in 2017 for new life insurance policies sold at approximately 28% and 18% respectively. Could I tender those two documents, Commissioner? Exhibit 6.4 will be chart of market share of new policies sold by premium, RCD 0026 0001 0004. Exhibit 6.5 will be chart of market share of new policies sold by number of policies, RCD 0026 0001 0005. There have been a number of significant movements in ownership in the life insurance industry since 2016, some of which involve the entities which will be the subject of case studies during this round of hearings. We'll mention some of these movements now. In March 2016, Zurich Australia Limited announced that it had acquired Macquarie Life's life insurance business from the Macquarie Group. 
In October 2016, NAB announced completion of the sale of approximately 80 per cent of its life insurance business provided by MLC to Nippon Life Insurance Company. The sale price was $2.4 billion. As part of the sale, NAB entered a partnership with Nippon Life, which included a 20-year distribution agreement to provide life insurance products through NAB's owned and aligned distribution networks. In May this year, NAB announced that it would divest its ownership of MLC, including the remaining 20% stake in its life insurance business. That process is expected to be completed by the end of next year. In September 2017, CBA announced the sale of its life insurance businesses in Australia, CMLA, and New Zealand, Sovereign, to AIA Group. The sale price was $3.8 billion. The sale agreement includes a 20-year partnership with AIA for the provision of life insurance products to customers in Australia and New Zealand. Under the terms of the partnership, CBA will continue to earn income on the distribution of life insurance products. This transaction is expected to be completed this year. In December last year, ANZ announced the sale of its life insurance business, One Path Life, to Zurich Financial Services Australia. The sale is comprised of two transactions with total proceeds of $2.85 billion, comprising $1.85 billion for the life business and $1 billion of upfront reinsurance commission from Zurich. Finally, in August this year, Suncorp announced that it has entered into a non-binding heads of agreement to sell its Australian life insurance business to Tao Daiichi Life Australia for approximately $725 million after writing down the value of the business by $880 million. Approximately $600 million will be returned to shareholders from the sale, which includes a 20-year agreement with Tao to distribute its product through Suncorp channels. Completion of this transaction is expected to occur by the end of the year, subject to the satisfaction of conditions and approvals in Australia and Japan. Total proceeds from the sale of life companies to foreign companies by Australian financial institutions over the past two years has now reached about $10 billion. We turn, Commissioner, to the types of life insurance products that Australians buy. In the first week of these hearings, we'll focus on the four main types of life insurance cover. Life cover, which pays a set amount of money to beneficiaries on the death of the policyholder. Total and permanent disability, or TPD cover, which pays a lump sum to assist with rehabilitation and living costs if the policyholder becomes totally and permanently disabled. Income protection cover, which replaces income lost by the policyholder through inability to work due to injury or sickness. And trauma cover, which provides cover to the policyholder if they are diagnosed with a specified illness or injury. We will explain each of these types of life insurance in more detail later in the week. We asked the 10 life insurers for data about the types of life insurance they sold for each year from 2013. Could we please show RCD 0026 0001 0006? As we can see from this chart, the most commonly sold type of life insurance cover in 2017 was life cover at 38% followed by income protection cover at 25%, TPD cover at 21%, and finally trauma cover at 16%. Could I tender that document, Commissioner? Exhibit 6.6 .6 chart of type of life insurance policy sold by number of policies, RCD 0026 0001 0006. Commissioner, uh, this may also be an appropriate time for me to tender the first set of witness statements that set out the information that I've referred to. Uh, could I start with Tal, Commissioner? Yes. I tender the witness statement of Timothy Thorne dated the 22nd of August 2018. 
That will be Exhibit 6.7. The supplementary witness statement of Timothy Thorne dated the 7th of September 2018. Will become Exhibit 6.8. The witness statement of Jennifer Oliver, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Becomes Exhibit 6.9. And a further witness statement of um, Timothy Thorne, dated the 7th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.10. In relation to AIA, I tender the witness statement of Michael Thornton, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.11. And a supplementary witness statement of Mr Thornton dated the 6th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.12. For MLC, I tender the witness statement of Sean McCormack dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.13. The witness statement of Ross Barnwell dated the 3rd of September 2018. Exhibit 6.14. The witness statement of Geoffrey Rogers, dated the 3rd of September 2018. Exhibit 6.15. From Westpac, I tender the witness statement of Susan Horton, H-O-U-G-H-T-O-N, dated the 3rd of September 2018. 6.16. And the witness statement of Michael Wright, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 6.17. From Zurich, I tender the witness statement of Tim Bailey, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.18. From MetLife, I tender the witness statement of Chesney Stafford, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.19. From CMLA, I tender the witness statement of Helen Troop, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.20. The witness statement of Maria Lycouris, L-Y-K-O-U-R-A-S, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.21. The witness statement of Mark Ballantyne, B-A-L-L-A-N-T-Y-N-E, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.22. And the witness statement of Hugh Humphrey, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.23. For one path, I tender the witness statement of Gavin Pearce, P-E-A-R-C-E, -E, dated the 21st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.24. From Suncorp, I tender the witness statement of Christopher McHugh, dated 27 August 2018. Exhibit 6.25. And finally, from AMP, I tender the witness statement of Gregory Johnson, dated the 10th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.26. Um, we turn now, Commissioner, to what the Commission has heard from consumers, consumer representatives and the Financial Ombudsman Service about the experiences of consumers with life insurance companies. As at the 7th of September, the Commission had received a total of 8,769 public submissions of which 681 have been identified as relating to life insurance, constituting 8% of total submissions received by the Commission. <coughs> the issues raised most commonly in the public submissions relate to claims handling, particularly delay and difficulties experienced as part of this process, and the sale of life insurance, including sale of inappropriate products or issues experienced with premium costs. Two further issues raised in the public submissions should be highlighted due to the volume of submissions received on these topics. The first is the treatment of mental health in life insurance. Common themes in the submissions addressing mental health are consumer experiences in being denied coverage or benefit on the basis of mental health exclusions, excessive premiums being charged where mental health issues are disclosed, claims of mental health conditions being exacerbated as a result of claims handling processes, and concerns over independent medical examinations as part of the claims process. On a related point, the Commission also heard from many consumers about the treatment of pre-existing medical conditions. A number of public submissions related to claims being refused on the basis of an unrelated pre-existing injury or condition, 
consumers contesting the exist existence or extent of the pre-existing condition, inappropriate treatment of pre-existing conditions in the claims process leading to a denial of benefit, and consumers being locked into high premiums as a result of an inability to change policies because of the existence of a pre-existing condition. We turn to what the Commission has been told by consumer bodies about the experience of consumers with life insurance. The Commission received submissions from a number of consumer organisations and met with them in preparation for these hearings. A number of consumer organisations reported providing advice and assistance to consumers in relation to insurance benefits held through superannuation. There were reports of a general lack of awareness on the part of consumers about the life insurance products they hold through superannuation. In addition, Legal Aid New South Wales and the Financial Rights Legal Centre both reported that they observe a significant amount of over-insurance through superannuation amongst their clients, which leads to an erosion of superannuation balances. Choice told the Commission about their concerns relating to poor policy design for group life insurance, including policies that may not be adequately targeted to meet the needs of the members of a particular superannuation fund. Poor claims handling was another issue raised by many of the consumer organisations. Many organisations reported difficulties faced by consumers in participating in the claims process without the benefit of legal representation. For example, New South Wales Legal Aid told the Commission about barriers their clients face in obtaining claim forms in the first instance or improving their identity to the insurer or superannuation fund. This issue was particularly prevalent in relation to Indigenous consumers. Other organisations reported that insurers were not complying with the timeframes for complaints handling set out in the Life Insurance Code. A number of organisations identified claim fatigue as a significant issue which leads to a high number of claims being withdrawn before they are determined. A significant theme to emerge from consumer and other submissions was the difficulties faced in engaging in claims processes, including appeals, without appropriate legal representation. Exploitative practices with respect to the sale of life insurance were identified by a number of consumer organisations primarily in relation to direct sales of life insurance. Particular concerns were raised in relation to the advertising, marketing and sales techniques used to sell life insurance products direct to consumers. For example, the Consumer Action Law Centre identified misleading adver advertising and cold calling as contributing to inappropriate sales, as customers are subjected to pressure selling and can be misled about pre-existing medical condition exclusions. The Financial Rights Legal Centre told the Commission that an overemphasis on cooling off periods as a time for a consumer to read a product disclosure statement, as well as the ease of obtaining direct debit payments from low income earning consumers, lead to poor outcomes for consumers including significant misunderstandings regarding the nature of the product being sold and the costs of that product. A number of consumer organisations also express concerns with the state of consumer law in relation to insurance policies. Organisations such as the Consumer Action Law Centre identified that a lack of protection in relation to unfair policy terms can cause claim shock for policyholders at traumatic and vulnerable times in their lives. The Commission also received submissions from the Public Interest Advocacy Centre and Beyond Blue about the treatment of mental health issues in insurance. Both organisations highlighted the difficulties that can be faced by individuals who have or have previously had or are imputed to have a mental health condition in securing coverage in relation to both life and general insurance products. They raised issues with how insurers design, price 
and offer policies and assess claims for people with mental health conditions and the effect that this has on their access to the insurance market. These problems were raised in relation to travel, income protection, TPD and life insurance products. We turn briefly to what FOS told the Commission about its role in handling disputes relating to life insurance. FOS reported receiving 1,307 disputes relating to life insurance products in 2016 to 17. Most life insurance disputes it received related to a decision to deny a claim. FOS told the Commission that life insurance disputes generally arise as a result of the application and interpretation of policy definitions, where the definition is overly restrictive, ambiguous or outdated. In its view, certain definitions have not kept pace with current clinical, medical or diagnostic tools. Typically, these matters also involve instances where community expectations about what a policy covers differ from the highly technical definitions in policies and the narrow interpretation applied by the insurer in assessing the claim. We turn briefly to what ASIC has told the Commission about the enforcement action it has taken in respect of life insurance. ASIC told the Commission that it has taken enforcement action in relation to life insurance on 78 occasions since the 1st of January 2008. We provide some examples of this action. First, ASIC has commenced civil penalty proceedings on three occasions, each relating to the provision of personal insurance advice. Second, ASIC has issued infringement notices in respect of life insurance to two entities. In 2015, TAL paid a penalty of $10,200 uh, under an infringement notice issued for false or misleading television advertisements promoting its income protection product. In 2014, Virgin Money paid a total of $30,600 in penalties after ASIC issued three infringement notices for misleading online and television advertising relating to the promotion of its quick and easy life insurance product. Third, ASIC has facilitated customer remediation programs by life insurers on 16 occasions. We give three examples. The first um, in, relates to Clearview. In February this year, ASIC found that Clearview had engaged in unfair and high pressure sales tactics for selling life insurance policies by telephone. Clearview agreed to implement a remediation program that involved a commitment to refund premiums, bank fees and interest to certain customers, to refund half of premiums and interest to other customers, and to offer a sales call review to other eligible customers and remediate if there was evidence of poor conduct. As we've indicated, the conduct the subject of this remediation will be examined in our first case study. Second, in 2013, uh, a remediation program was developed following a review of Suncorp's compliance systems, which resulted in over 849,000 policyholders being refunded approximately $23 million. Third, in 2017, an ASIC review of product obligations for certain life insurance products within CMLA's superannuation and investments portfolio identified policies where an additional accidental death benefit was not paid. CMLA established a remediation program that involved refunds totaling $255,000 for 13 consumers. The final topic that we'll address in this open statement is the case studies, which will be explored in the first week of these hearings. The first two case studies concern the direct sales of life insurance by two financial services licensees, Clearview and Freedom. The Commission will hear evidence about the methods these entities use and have used to sell their products to consumers and also about policies providing cover for accidental death. We'll also provide an overview of the information the Commission has received from other entities about accidental death policies. 
The third case study will consider issues connected with policy design and the claims handling process. The Commission will hear evidence about claims involving the definitions of heart attack and cancer in policies issued by Cominsure. The final case studies this week will examine the treatment of mental health and mental illness in life insurance claims handed by, handled by TAL and issues connected with the provision of group life insurance policies through superannuation by REST and AMP. The issues in connection with group life insurance policies include the design of the products and the role of superannuation trustees in the claims handling process. We'll also provide a summary of the information that we have received relating to claims handling more generally and in relation to the use of surveillance in the claims process. In week two, as we've said, we will turn to consider general insurance products. Uh, Commissioner, that concludes our opening address. The first witness that we call, will call will be Mr Martin of Clearview, but perhaps uh, we could have a brief break before we do that. If I come back at, what, 10 to midday? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.